So hello everyone. Welcome to this session of the Permit Theory webinar series. Today, Anna Niarakis is going to talk about development of a virtual rheumatoid arthritis synovial fibroblast for large scale dynamic analysis and efficient drug target identification. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of MBLDBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. Please note that all materials are licensed under a CC BY 4.0 license, except where further licensing details are provided. Let me now introduce uh, the project. Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of the cell simulation software nowadays is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. So Permit COE is going to scale up a different software for cell simulations to the HPC exascale systems in order to create models of cellular functions with medical relevance. Permit COE is going to achieve this through a series of, obje of objectives. First, it's going to optimize uh, cell level simulation software. Second, uh, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase, it, showcase applications of the Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as uh, drug interaction or uh, COVID-19 virus and patients tissue modeling. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of these tools, integrating the permit communities into the European HPC ecosystem, and building the basis for the sustainability of Permit COE. Let me now introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Anna Niarakis is an associate professor uh, at the University of uh, Ebri at Paris Saclay, and she's also affiliated with Genotel. Uh, the European Research Laboratory for Rheumatoid Arthritis, Genopol. She holds a three-year delegation for research at INRIA in the group LifeWare. She has a broad scientific background in biochemistry, biology, and pharmaceutical technology, and postdoctoral studies in computational systems biology and bioinformatics, with expertise in complex human diseases. She is a co-leader of the Disease Maps Consortium, an active member of Colomoto, and a former coordinator of CISMOD. So, Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matt. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. It's both an honor and uh, a pleasure. So, let me uh, share my screen now. And let me ask uh, the usual questions Can you see my slides and can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so uh, yes, today I'm going to uh, present you some of the efforts that we have been uh, um, uh, doing the past uh, several years in order to model uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, today I'm going to focus mostly on rheumatoid arthritis fibroblast, but I will explain how this can actually be uh, integrated into a larger um, scale project. So before going into the computational uh, part and the simulations, uh, I would like to, um, to say a few words about the disease. Uh, so rheumatoid arthritis is a complex uh, autoimmune disease uh, that causes chronic inflammation of the joints. So the immune system mistakenly um, attacks the synovial uh, lining. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Surrounding the joints uh, leading to an inflammatory response. So we have inflammation, um, sustained inflammation that is caused by the resident cells, but also by the cells of um, the immune system that will be uh, infiltrated into the joints. This response thickens the synovium by laying down uh, mostly fibroblasts here and causes destruction of the cartilage, the sponge like tissue, and bone. The result of this process, as you can imagine, is severe deformation of the joints uh, and, of course, pain. 
the way that we treat rheumatoid arthritis has been revolutionized um, the past um, uh, few years uh, by the uh, development of the biologic drugs. However, um, a large percentage of patients that is estimated somewhere between 20 and 40 percent uh, fail to fully respond to therapy. As you can understand, this creates a major societal and economical burden, but most importantly, this has uh, a major impact on the quality of life of these patients. So why rheumatoid arthritis fibroblasts, uh, the main uh, focus of my talk today? Uh, as you can see in the figure here, um, there is a, a similar interplay and a similar crosstalk um, that, um, that plays a role in rheumatoid arthritis initiation all the way up to inflammation and bone destruction. However, fibroblasts play a key role as they um, they have receptors not only for pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also TLRs, and they are uh, responsible for a high proliferative activity and the production of uh, cytokines, chemokines, and matrix-degrading enzymes in response to these pro-inflammatory cues, uh, which lead to the exacerbation of synovitis and joint destruction. Moreover, uh, we have now accumulating evidence that T cells are not passive responders to this toxic inflamed uh, environment of the joints, but they are actually transformed aggressors. This um, um, hypoxic environment actually causes them to acquire an aggressive phenotype, uh, highly invasive uh, between uh, the joints, um, between the bone and the cartilage, and they are also resistant to apoptosis. last few years also there is this hype of uh, digital twins and and how we can take this concept and uh, um, and adapt it for medical digital twins how can we model these complex systems um, as we do in industry or in um, uh, in aerospace for example mechanics so um as you can see with a very simple definition, we would say that a digital twin is a virtual representation that serves as the real-time digital counterpart of a physical object or process. Even with such a very simple uh, definition, we can quickly understand that there are some, well, not very simple things that we would need to tackle in order to take this concept and apply it um, in medicine. First of all, this real time means that we need a, a two-way flow of information between the physical object, in our case, this would be the patient, and the virtual counterpart, something that is not quite evident for a large number of complex human disease. The other part also implies that we have the knowledge, we have the blueprint of the mechanism that we would like to, uh, uh, to mimic. And this, in most parts of, um, in most uh, complex diseases, this is, not, uh, this is not possible. Our knowledge remains fragmented, so we can also make some hypotheses about the mechanisms that are implicated, but still, there are a lot of parts of this uh, puzzle uh, of disease uh, missing. I would like to, um, um, to take the opportunity to propose a conceptual scaffold of how a digital twin for rheumatoid arthritis or for another complex disease uh, could uh, look like. So what we would need uh, would be uh, a system that would help us incorporate and integrate different types of data. For example, we can imagine that we have a, uh, an input gate where we can uh, uh, inject into our system different types of data like uh, prior and empirical knowledge about the system, omics data like uh, differentially expressed genes, for example, AI-assisted data mining um, to, um, uh, to support uh, experimental evidence, low throughput experiments, um, and we could use them in order to recreate um, backbone models. For example, process description or mechanistic causal diagrams that would give us an idea of how, uh, how the mechanism of this, um, of this disease could look like. And then we would need to add dynamical layers, we would need to add the mathematics in order to describe how one factor could uh, exert control or regulation over another and create this type of executable models in order to uh, perform an analysis. And then we would need to uh, analyze, calibrate, 
combine, integrate, and contextualize these models in order to perform uh, simulations uh, that could mimic, uh, for example, in silico knockouts or knock-ins, generate hypotheses that are uh, difficult to uh, reproduce um, in the lab, uh, time-consuming or just uh, the technology is not there yet, identify novel targets and perform drug response analysis, and then personalize the suggestions um, in regards of the profile of the patient tested and uh, uh, propose, first of all, in vitro validation assays before adding new knowledge and, and probably um, use this type of uh, infrastructure for preclinical and cl clinical decision making. We would also need to, uh, to imagine that um, we would need input gates uh, for other types of health indicators and clinical data, like biosensors, for example, or even patient self-evaluation um, information. And then we would also need to have input and output gates to high-performance computing, uh, cloud computing, or ways to parallelize some of the simulations to ease the computational burden. These things are nice, uh, but in reality, we uh, we don't really know where to start. Um, we are kind of um, overwhelmed uh, with uh, the multiple scales of biology and the wealth of information that we can have in this multiple different scales. So as you can see, we, we have now uh, the opportunity to, uh, to have data uh, in the genome scale and the whole genome scale, also transcriptomics and proteomics and metabolomics. And then we can have information regarding the interactome, signaling cascades, in vitro phenotypes, all the way up to um, physiological type of information and also uh, population uh, level. So if we take a middle out approach, uh, starting with pathways, starting somewhere in the middle, like pathways and, and probably cell level would make sense as this would allow us for the biological question and the scientific interest, either to zoom in and add some more details or to scale up and go all the way up to population level models. So starting with molecular uh, pathways and, and cell level seems like a good compromise. Viewing the uh, cells in terms of their underlying network is also a very powerful concept. First of all, in biology, we know that nothing acts in isolation. So Having a list of genes or proteins that we know that are implicated in a given disease mechanism doesn't say, uh, doesn't say much about the actual mechanism. So what we really want to know is how these things interact together, how these factors exert control and regulation over one uh, another. So organizing biological information in, in the form of networks First of all, it allows us to borrow concepts from graph theory and mathematics and use their tools and, and analysis methods to make some sense out of the biological complexity. The second, um, the second reason is also because uh, if we want to apply systems level where we need to, first of all, define the system. In order to um, organize this type of graphs in a way that is formalized and machine readable, um, the systems biology community has proposed three formalized um, systems biology graphical notation schemes, three graphical languages that someone can use in order to uh, depict these networks in a, in a way that is both human but also machine readable in order to, to analyze it further. So we have process descriptions, uh, activity flows, and entity uh, relationships that differ in the way that they depict biological mechanisms and processes, and they also differ in the wealth of information that they can encode. So as you can see, process description diagrams are the richest of all. Uh, they are directed, mechanistic, and sometimes sequential. Um, while activity flows are also very well used uh, as they offer a more compact view of, um, of the network. So several initiatives uh, have been uh, have developed over the years, uh, focusing on uh, reconstructing large scale molecular pathways uh, that are uh, describing disease mechanisms. So disease maps is one of these um, 
international uh, initiatives. Um, in my lab, we are mostly interested in rheumatoid arthritis um, the past two, three years in, in COVID. So the idea is to um, gather every information available uh, and uh, construct a formalized molecular um, network that uh, includes all molecular pathways involved in the onset and progression of uh, the disease uh, of interest. So the past several years, we have been trying to, um, to create an RE map uh, um, in order to, uh, to have an idea of all the pathways that have been scientifically and experimentally proven to be implicated in, in the disease. So we, we did the extra mile to, to use SBGN process description standards, which is not a very easy endeavor, in order to um, uh, depict the way that uh, 800 species react with each other uh, and how they give rise to nine different cellular phenotypes, like, for example, inflammation, apoptosis, proliferation, matrix and bone degradation, to, uh, to give you an example. And um, this is uh, via uh, 600 reactions, biochemical reactions. This type of constructs can actually act like encyclopedias of the disease, where you can also store information regarding the source uh, of information. Where did you find this? Um, can we uh, actually have access? Why did you depict this reaction the way you did? And how can we be sure that this molecule was really proven to, uh, to have a role in the disease settings? So you can use uh, different types of identifiers um, uh, in order to encode this type of information that later on can also be retrieved in order to create a fully annotated executable models. These constructs um, can be very useful in many different ways. Uh, they are not the focus of, of my talk today, so I will just very briefly give you some examples. We can transform them into Google Maps. So. Um, you can have an online knowledge base for the disease where you can uh, you can do queries. Uh, you can search for uh, nodes. Uh, you can search for molecules, genes, or proteins. Uh, some bubbles will pop up there. And then you can also ask for itineraries. And you can also access all the information that is used in order to create this, this map. The map can also be used as a template uh, for omics data visualization. We can project differentially expressed genes between control and patients and see which parts of the pathways are affected in one or the other group. And you can also um, project overlays in order to increase cell type specificity, for example. And um, last but not least, uh, you can analyze them as complex graphs because this is what they are uh, in, in reality. And uh, you can perform uh, all types of topological analysis, identify hubs, uh, um, identify nodes with uh, topological characteristics, um, identify shortest paths and, and this type of things. And also you can um, apply different clustering algorithms in order to modularize your, uh, your network and study different modules uh, separately. But this talk is about executable models and, and how we can use this, this constructs and this, this wealth of information in order to create um, computational models that we can use for hypothesis testing, predictions, and in silico simulations. So since um, 20, uh, 2018, we have been collaborating with INRIA and the Lightware uh, Laboratory, where I'm actually um, in delegation in order to create tools that would allow us to, first of all, create more compact uh, versions of these complex networks, and at the same time, in fair reasoning, in fair rules that describe the regulation that one node accepts to the other. So we have been working on, on a tool, um, on a framework uh, that, first of all, uh, performs a graph conversion. So we pass from a process description a detailed mechanistic pathway to an activity flow to an influence graph uh, automatically based on uh, some rules, semantics, and annotations already existing in, in the map. Uh, and at the same time, we use this information to infer preliminary logic rules uh, that would allow us to execute uh, the model. So in a very, very simple model, um, in a very simple example, we can see how a process description 
a phosphorylation of RAP1 uh, under the influence of some uh, enzyme, uh, some kinase, uh, will be translated into the model. Here we have uh, X that will act as a catalyst, while here we have X that will act as a positive um, influencer over RAF1. And then on the same time, we can have a logical function, very simplified, that would say that RAF1 equals X, meaning that to have RAF1 activated, uh, you would need the presence of X. Imagine doing that uh, automatically for every reaction depicted uh, for 600 reactions and 700 species already um, encoded in the, in the map. So we use this framework with multiple disease maps, uh, but uh, I'm going to focus on the RA1 uh, because um, this is our main interest in, in the lab, uh, and we create the dynamical model. This dynamical model was more compact and fully executable and allowed us to actually perform uh, in silico simulations. Yet, it was a model that was coming from a generic map that had no cell specificity. I will not bore you with details, but we had to pass a lot of steps in order to enrich this map in, in cell specificity, in order to make it more uh, RA fibroblast um, relevant. So what we did uh, um, next uh, was to create um, five module-like models uh, that were focusing on one of, of the five major uh, cellular phenotypes that were of interest. Uh, matrix degradation, osteoclastogenesis, and bone erosion, inflammation, apoptosis, and cell proliferation. We created these models in, in a way, uh, in a modular way, that um, allowed us to actually combine them together. So this allowed us to study each of the submodules separately, and at the end, combine them all together to see what is happening uh, in terms of um, the effect of different initial conditions to all five uh, phenotypes. As you can see in the table, the model with the five phenotypes is not the sum of the submodels, and this is because there is a, a core in the main network that is shared in all these different submodels. We used the um, logic-based models, the logical formalism in its simplest form, Boolean, so we assign binary values to, uh, to all nodes. Logic-based models are suitable for large-scale uh, biological networks. They are parameter-free, and um, you have a logic function that actually explains uh, how one node controls the regulation of uh, the downstream uh, uh, nodes that are connected with it uh, each time the model is updated. The time in this type of models is not continuous, it's discrete, it's like taking snapshots of your system. And we have two major updating schemes, uh, synchronous, where all nodes are updated according to the rules in the next time step, or asynchronous, that only one is uh, permitted to get updated. Of course, there are a number of updating schemes uh, in between, uh, but um, I won't be going into detail. So in a very simple um, in a very simple example, uh, you can see how we can use this formalism to actually do predictions. And predictions is understanding what the behavior of, for example, the gene or protein C would be in regards of uh, the previous um, the previous state of its regulators. So if we have three nodes, uh, uh, we can have a uh, a and B that act as activators or positive um, influences, they exert a positive influence over C. We can have one activator and one inhibitor and two inhibitors and so, so on and so forth. And you can see that depending on the logical gate that we use, uh, and or or, either two of them are um, important to be present or only one of them is sufficient to uh, activate or suppress uh, C, the prediction will uh, radically change. So this is why uh, incorporating and integrating prior knowledge, uh, for example, if these, if A and B are cofactors, then we know that this is an end gate. If we know that uh, these come from different pathways and they can activate uh, C in a pretty much independent way, then an OR gate would make more sense. So this is just to say that while we um, automate some of the model inference, biological knowledge and, and domain expertise is um, is of utmost important, importance to create models that are biologically relevant. 
So we used um, simulations, uh, um, continuous type phenotypic probability simulations using MABOS, uh, um, a software simulator that was uh, developed by the Institute Curie in order to evaluate the model's behavior. So first, we started with very simple biological scenarios to see if our model is actually, uh, well, uh, good. If it was able to reproduce uh, biological scenarios experimentally validated. So here you see simple examples, for example, activating in the Rutin 6 and what will be the effect on inflammation, matrix degradation phenotype in different initial conditions, activating and deactivating MMPs, uh, cell growth, uh, um, growth factors and what will happen in survival and proliferation, and also more complex scenarios like fast ligand, AKT2, and apoptosis, where fast ligand activates apoptosis, AKT2 will deactivate apoptosis. And this allowed us to actually spot discrepancies uh, between the model's behavior and the actual experimental evidence. And we had to go through several iterative um, cycles in order to improve the model's performance by um, changing the rules or uh, probably adding more details because we were missing uh, some important biology. So once the model was robust enough uh, to reproduce uh, uh, a large number of biological scenarios, we, we used it to mimic the effects of single or combined treatment. So we took um, the treatment that is most popular uh, and uh, administered to patients uh, as a first or second round of, uh, of treatment and we, we mimic the effects. First of all, you can see that most of the treatment um, uh, had no effect in apoptosis. Apoptosis would remain um, off, um, which is consistent with the biology of the fibroblasts and rheumatoid arthritis that are apoptosis resistant. And yet these, these drugs are mostly anti-inflammatory. So what we would expect would be a change into the inflammation phenotype. And as you can see, uh, most of these drugs were not sufficient enough to suppress fully the inflammation signal. What was um, impressive was that uh, three of these drugs, um, uh, one combination and two uh, solo uh, treatments, uh, were actually able on their own to fully suppress inflammation. This type of results were then compared with clinical trials and experimental evidence, and the model was pretty robust in, in reproducing this type of, um, of information. So next, uh, what we did is that um, we went to these uh, five phenomenological uh, cellular phenotypes, like apoptosis, inflammation, bone degradation, and we looked at the logical formulas that were um, responsible for the regulation of them. So we found the direct upstream regulators, and then we did an exhaustive uh, drug search analysis, either with drugs that have already been used and administra administered for the treatment of RA, or drugs that had as targets the given molecules, the given factors, and were tested either in vitro or in different settings. So what we did was that uh, with some additional criteria, of course, we excluded, for example, treatments that had failed in clinical trials or um, inhibitors that had shown uh, excessive toxicity. So at the end, uh, we ended up uh, with um, some suggestions regarding drugs that had or had not been tested in rheumatoid arthritis that according to our model would have, uh, well, the desired effect, increase apoptosis and suppress inflammation, bone erosion, matrix degradation, and cell proliferation. Some of these um, combinations have never been tested, even in vitro. So what we would like to do next is to, to use these predictions and see if they make sense, at least um, in in vitro stage. So to sum up uh, what uh, I have been uh, presenting so far is that we started with a large scale molecular interaction map. So prior knowledge, empirical knowledge, pathway bases, information about um, networks and molecular pathways, and signaling pathways implicated in disease. We enriched them using human data and low throughput experiments, and then we added annotations, mechanistic information, and we used our framework within RIA to transform the static map into a, a large-scale Boolean model for the disease. Then we use single cell uh, omics data and bulk omics data to uh, 
improve model enrichment in cell specificity, and we generated our models, either phenotype specific or a global phi phenotypic, uh, phi phenotype model. We evaluated the model with uh, many cycles, many iterations of uh, trial and error in the simulations. We um, modified some of the rules, and when our model was robust enough, we used it in order to perform uh, in silico simulations of mono and combined therapies. We identified um, novel targets, we performed drug repurposing analysis, and then we, we started to test drug combinations. Um, what we wanted to do was to have apoptosis active and all other phenotypes inactive, and then we had to also pass to another step in deleting drugs with evident fails and have uh, uh, some winning combinations that were just a, a very small fraction of what we, uh, we originally had found in all the drug enrichment methods. So um, this work uh, is now in bioarchive and we are actually in the first round of revisions. Uh, we, we are undergoing peer review as we talk. Uh, and um, of course, you can have access to um, all data and, uh, and figures that um, I have presented here. Next, we wanted to see how um, signaling and gene regulation has also an impact on the metabolic fluxes of these cells. And this is because immunometabolism is also a rising tendency nowadays, uh, identifying metabolic switches that can be used in order to reprogram the cells and, and push them back in order to acquire a more healthy uh, phenotype, or at least a more benign one less harmful and debilitating for the disease. So what we did uh, was to take our logical model, focused on uh, some, some additional phenotypes that made sense in order to have this overlap between gene regulation, signaling, and metabolism, and we coupled the model with a constraint-based model of human central metabolism. So what we did, uh, um, I will not bore you with very technical details, uh, but just to say that these models are very big and their uh, analysis is not an easy task. So we used um, um, input propagation algorithm in order to simplify a little bit uh, the computational cost by fixing some initial conditions uh, based on experimental evidence and propagating this uh, fixed values, either zero or one, because we are always in, in the Boolean uh, space, and simplify as much as we could, then um, we would use these conditions as a new set of initial conditions, fixing a maximum of nodes that we could, and uh, set there for stable say, states and attractors in, in this new perturbed model. So we, we were able, by applying this type of framework, to find uh, eight uh, stable states, fixed points, here we say trap spaces because in, in reality we calculate trap spaces that is a good approximation of attractors uh, and um, uh, we wanted to study if these um, stable states this these spaces where our system cannot escape without external intervention had any biological meaning at all and actually they had um, so you can see that in most cases um, apoptosis is zero which is pretty consistent with the apoptotic resistant phenotype of these cells. And then uh, in rheumatoid arthritis conditions, you would expect bone erosion, inflammation, matrix degradation, and geogenesis to be, uh, to be activated. What was interesting was that the hypoxic phenotype was either one or zero, depending on the conditions. So these eight trap spaces um, allowed us to actually fix, uh, constrain our metabolic model using uh, the zeros of the stable states as constraints for the metabolic uh, uh, enzymes uh, and, um, this allow and the metabolites. And this allowed us to actually um, put 50 metabolic reaction fluxes constrained to zero. So in order to mimic the healthy, let's say, metabolic uh, um, profile, we would launch a flex balance analysis um, without any constraint. And then we would add these 50 metabolic reaction flex constraints in order to mimic the disease effect. And as you can see here, 
For the healthy state, 96 of total ATP production is made through the TCA and the oxidative phosphorylation uh, pathways, while in the disease condition, we see a, a switch in the production of ATP, where most of the ATPs are produced by glycolysis. So this can be um, very close to a, a reverse workbook effect uh, that was um, very recently uh, uh, proposed, or let's say, um, um, proposed as, as a probable uh, scenario for the cells. Uh, and uh, we were able to reproduce it with our computational framework. Then we went back and we, um, we performed a set of regulatory knockouts and knock-ins regarding our initial conditions in order to see if we could switch uh, this metabolic profile and push the production of ATPs back to uh, the OXFOS and TCA um, pathways. As you can see, the only knockout that had any effect uh, in uh, um, the production of glycolysis and OXFOS was the knockout of uh, HIF1. It is coherent also with recent experimental studies demonstrating that HIF1 knockdown reduces glycolytic metabolism in human synovial fibroblasts. So these models are um, quite complex, but with also many simplifications in order to be realistically simulatable, can give us important insights uh, into the disease mechanisms, and they can actually give us indications about possible targets or identify important roles for certain factors. So the general architecture of this uh, computational framework is that we use Boolean formalism and uh, logic-based models for the signaling and gene regulation part. And then we use uh, genome scale metabolic models for the metabolic part. We, we use the enzymes uh, and the metabolites that lie in the interface uh, between uh, the metabolic fluxes and um, signaling and gene regulation in order to create links between the two of them. And this actually allows us to uh, to study the effect that initial conditions of different external stimuli can have on, on metabolism. So this work was recently published uh, in PLOS Computational Biology, and we're actually now trying to, uh, to apply the same framework in a different model uh, related to uh, cancer uh, metabolism. Before finishing my presentation, and while this, this is not in the title, I would like also to um, to say a few words about the project that we have been um, uh, developing uh, with the help of Sanofi in order to create a multicellular model for rheumatoid arthritis. So instead of focusing only on fibroblasts, what we're doing now is that we are creating cell-specific models in the early settings for macrophages, T cells, and, uh, and fibroblasts. In the future, we would like to enrich uh, this ARI atlas with uh, maps and models for osteoclasts, dendritic cells, and probably um, B cells. So this is not very informative, and this is, has gone a, a little bit out of um, our capacities in order to navigate. But uh, I can tell you that we were also able to add intercellular interactions and create cell-specific maps that communicate with each other, and then uh, cell-specific models. We are working on a, on a framework that would allow us to ease the simulation using parallel computing and HPC settings, and also um, using a lot of omics data in order to filter steady states and, and attractors, and to uh, compare hmm, how the models behave in terms of uh, real high throughput data that we can acquire um, in the uh, in LA settings in cells coming from patients, for example, or blood coming from patients. So what we want to do um, in, this, in this project is focus on different um, behaviors for different cells. Uh, so kind of um, fixing what we would expect as phenotypes in, in a given setting, and then uh, adjust similarity scores between the model's behavior and the actual omic data in order to maximize the amount of nodes in this big models that we can fix. So just, let's say, uh, minimizing the, the number of nodes that uh, we don't really know what they do, uh, and uh, that would be the focus of the study. 
So what we did is that we have actually applied this framework in cell-specific models, and we are now running it for the huge multicellular model of rheumatoid arthritis that contains around 1,000 nodes and 240 inputs. With this, and with a lot of effort, uh, we were able to fix most of the inputs um, using values, applying values that are coherent with the biological behavior that we see in experimental evidence. And uh, we are now simulating it um, uh, using, well, uh, parallel computing and um, HPC settings uh, in order to, uh, to go through two in the power of 21 combinations. To summarize, what I have been uh, uh, showing you today is that integrated methodologies that support both data-driven but also prior knowledge model integration could offer better insight into disease mechanisms. So just automatic inference, just statistical analysis, um, gene lists and things like that do not work. On the other on the other part, having computational models that are large and complex without really knowing what you expect is, is not very informative either. So the real challenge is, is to put these things together. Scaling up is, is a real challenge. Um, we really need clever model reduction without a loss of information um, that is based less on empirical uh, trial and error uh, efforts and and more on formalized methodologies that could be applicable to, uh, to similar biological problems. Um, the models that we create, even when we reduce the complexity, are still big and they're still complex. Uh, even when we use only one formalism, even when we use only one layer of information, they are not very easily manageable with existing tools. So the need for better infrastructure and more robust simulation platforms is, is, is really there. <laughs> And to um, to be along, uh, let's say, uh, in line with the hype, uh, building modular models for different scales and biological layers that can operate in a plug-and-play fashion can actually improve reusability of the models, interoperability, and they can accelerate the construction of digital twins. Because if, for example, the model that we have, the sub-model that we have created for inflammation can be easily contextualized for a a different type of autoimmune disease or complex disease, you would need to go through the, the whole work uh, better in a, in a more, let's say, um, um, quick way. You could have an executable model that could suit your biological questions. So I would like to, um, to thank many people that uh, have uh, helped us over the years and um, mostly the students uh, that have led uh, uh, this work. Uh, um, and also my collaborators um, at uh, the INRIA, at the INRIA lab uh, at Lifeware, Sylvain uh, Soliman and François Fage, of course, Denis and Aurélien uh, um, from the Colomoto community and the logic model community, Benjamin Hall with BMA from UCL, Frank Jose from uh, Sanofi Paris, uh, Benjamin Giori, uh, I, I didn't have the time to show what we are doing with Benjamin, maybe in another one. Our clinicians, um, also uh, Marek from uh, the Center of Systems Medicine, Systems Biomedicine in Luxembourg, Thomas Helikar and Reinhard Laubenpacher. And um, before uh, finishing, I would like to say that we develop, we are really community oriented and uh, community driven. So what we develop, uh, we develop it in line with um, different systems biology communities. Uh, so the tools and the frameworks that I have showed you, we had the chance to apply them for the ecosystem of the COVID-19 disease map project. Now we are working on the immune digital twin project and we create tools that are um, interoperable and compatible with systems biology community standards like SBML or SBGM. And to advertise shamelessly, we have a three-week spring workshop on immune digital twins at the Institute Pascal uh, in spring. We still have some places um, uh, open. So if you're interested, don't hesitate to uh, reach out. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention, and I would be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much for a very nice uh, presentation. I think 
you, you have explained from almost the beginning towards the most complex uh, situations. Um, so please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel to uh, ask uh, any questions uh, you may have. Okay, so we already have a couple of questions. Okay, the first one is a bit long. How can the integration of Boolean modeling with other modeling approaches in biology be achieved effectively, given the different assumptions and limitations of each modeling approach? And what strategies can be used to reconcile the predictions of these different models to create a more comprehensive understanding of biological systems? So um, I don't think there is only one answer to that. Um, I don't think that um, that there is one remedy for all uh, for all diseases. So it really depends. Um, compromising um, a little bit, uh, let's say. Um, the level of information sometimes might work, but it really depends on the biological question. And sometimes the time scales or the granularity are very far away. So you cannot really combine things uh, uh, in, a meaningful, uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so what we do uh, in the lab at least is that we try to, we have the biological question drive us and this um, scale that I showed uh, uh, in the first uh, slides of the presentation give us a way of thinking about things that we can combine. For example, we used Boolean model for signaling and gene regulation, and then we used uh, flux balance analysis, but we didn't use the same formalism. Some people have actually used Boolean formalism to simulate uh, um, metabolic pathways, but uh, we feel that this type of, of formalism is not probably the best. Also, the networks that we simulate are very big and we don't have kinetic information about them. If we had it for a subset of these large models, probably we would zoom in and create uh, more quantitative models, add stichiometry, uh, have some continuous time, probably some ODEs and, and simulate them. They would not be. Um, linked directly, but one framework would actually uh, um, predict or have uh, simulations that could be tested in a more detailed way using a different one. So um, I don't know if, if, my, if my answer is um, uh, satisfying the, the person who asked, uh, but I, I really don't think how we can integrate everything uh, without respecting a little bit the, the granularity of different biological layers. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. That there, were, this, there was a reply from the, from the attendee saying thank you. So, so I guess it's, it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, we have another question. Uh, hi, Anna. I was wondering if the cell models in the multicellular system integrate metabolic signaling pathways or focus on gene regulatory networks. So in the multicellular, we have not uh, yet, uh, let's say, um, tried to plug in metabolism. For the moment, we are overwhelmed with uh, the complexity and the computational cost um, of putting uh, four cell-specific uh, large-scale uh, models together. And um, I would say that, um, even more difficult than the computational part that was very challenging and the technical part also, but okay, we had a way of, uh, um, of overcoming um, uh, most of the difficulties. The most difficult part was to actually have initial conditions that would make sense because we don't really know the, the actual mechanism and how all these cells work together. We have some hypotheses and these hypotheses from the domain experts actually uh, uh, made it easier for us to start putting them together and, and simulating them. Uh, otherwise, the, the biological complexity was uh, such that even interpreting some of the simulation results was, was overwhelming, uh, was, was not possible. Uh, imagine trying to interpret the simulation for 400 nodes. We really don't have information, uh, low throughput or functional validation for all all these factors. What we have is omics data, and there you just discretize and 
and you just pull it's there or it's not there, or you use gene expression and transcriptomics as proxy for proteins in, in your signaling part. So we have a lot of, uh, of things to tackle. So we, we have not plugged in metabolism yet. But this is what we would like to do, have signaling, gene regulation, and metabolism uh, on the cellular level for the multicellular um, model also. But we're mm -hmm. not there yet. <laughs> OK, thank you for the, for the reply. Um, so while we have, uh, we have more questions coming in, just in, in, I mean, a bit in relation to this, uh, how do you decide when you are or when do you when how do you infer when your model is robust enough? Like when you are refining it, where how do you decide where to stop? You know, in a way. So for the cell specific models, it's easier uh, because there is a wealth of information of low throughput uh, experimental evidence that you could use. Even for example, ELISA experiments or Western blot, or classical molecular biology, where you you will block something with an inhibitor and then you see that the protein is not there. So it's not very easy to extract this type of information from the scientific literature. And this is where we are trying to use uh, text mining algorithms to facilitate a little bit the, the bio curation process. And we also collaborate with uh, domain experts, with clinicians or with um, um, rheumatologists that also perform experimental uh, work. And there we, we, we need to have a better understanding of how the cell actually works and how we can, we can actually assess, evaluate what we see. So um, sometimes it's not very easy. So we have a number of, uh, for example, for fibroblasts, I think we have a number of 30, 40 biological scenarios that start with very simple. And they go to very detailed or mechanistic, like for example, Pass ligand, AKT2 apoptosis, B1, the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways of apoptosis where we know a little bit the mechanism. So there we can we can push the model with more complex scenarios. We can monitor what is happening when we change the initial conditions for intermediates and not only for the, the phenomenological outputs. But it's not an easy task. And as I said, it's it's based on empirical knowledge and a lot of collaboration with uh, domain experts. There is no formal methodology that can actually mm -hmm. give you uh, a set of interpretations per se. Yep. Okay, 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 thanks. So we have another question. What would you recommend to do when there's conflicting information in the literature about the regulation or the effect of an entity? This is... Uh... This is very often the case. So um, what we do is that we try, for example, to set some objective criteria uh, regarding the, the noise that we are ready to incorporate, uh, to inject into our system. So for example, we, we use primarily human data, but sometimes there is a wealth of information for some of the mechanisms and especially for knockouts, knockings in mice. So we, we might go and, and use mice literature in order to complete some of the tasks that we don't have any, any other way of, uh, of getting this type of information. The other part is that sometimes you can use a generic pathway. So the generic pathways uh, for intrinsic and extrinsic, uh, uh, for example, uh, apop apoptosis could be used as a template and then uh, you can try to contextualize them in terms of cell or disease settings that, that you want. In the worst case, you will have something that is too generic, hmm? but you would need at some point to uh, contextualize it one way or the other. So you will have something that is a little bit more noisy. And as you advance in your project, you will try to narrow down this false positives that you have integrated. If there is no information at all, then... <laughs> Maybe this is not the way to go, and probably using um, uh, machine learning uh, network inference, data-driven uh, network inference methods might make more sense, where the mechanism is actually inferred from the algorithm, and it's not so much based on um, experimental evidence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, how does this relate to... Uh, for example, taking the decision of 
uh, moving to like trying a in trying trying in a clinical setting to prove like a kind of a trial of what you have of what is already like your results or what you think okay this is this is the outcome that we should we should get um so I, um, I, I, is so there there like barriers also because of not knowing like that level of uncertainty that you have so first of all um i would like to say that computational models should be validated at least in in, in some type of in vitro settings for example so um, we have this, this table where we actually propose new combinations that have not been tested in array, but we don't propose them for patients. We propose them, first of all, for in vitro validation. I think that jumping, making this logical jump from a computational model that has been uh, evaluated only by trial and error and scientific literature and not passing at least to one stage of validation in, in vitro, um, I think it's very dangerous. So yeah. these are uh, suggestions. I don't think that um, the computational work should be independent of the experimental work. I think that there should be a iterative cycles of um, suggestions, experimental validation or not, improvement of the model, predictions, experimental validation, and so on and so forth, until in vitro uh, results are really uh, promising uh, in order to step up. So um, I, I would be a bit cautious. So how we can go there? Um, I think we need collaboration with the clinics, and we also need um, model checking and um, some criteria, some kind of criteria or protocols for assessing the robustness of a computational model. Just to, uh, to add a, a comment, uh, computational biology is, is really moving ahead. And uh, last month, I think, or last uh, two months, uh, the FDA in the US actually accepted in silico simulation and modeling as validation for some of the uh, uh, food and, and drug, uh, let's say, uh, secondary effects predictions. So in Europe, it's, it's not there, but we see that the modeling part is really gaining traction and is becoming a very useful tool. I think that expertise is there, infrastructure is there, but we really need collaborative efforts to uh, um, harmonize things and, and move ahead. I don't think this is something that one lab or one person or uh, two labs can actually uh, achieve. Definitely, definitely, I agree. I mean, collaboration is very important between the different sectors. So just before finishing, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Okay. So just uh, very quickly, uh, can you see the slide of the next webinars? So just... Uh, Yes, just to say that uh, um, we have a virtual course coming up next week and you can register on the Permit COE website. Also, uh, at the Basal Computational Biology Conference, there is going to be a workshop uh, where some of the uh, permit speakers and and, and as, uh, also uh, evolved, if I'm correct. So you can also register at the moment. And there are going to be more webinars coming up in April, May, June. So please stay tuned and uh, follow us on our media to uh, yeah to find out about what's coming up. So uh, that's that's all I wanted to share. And so just say, Anna, thank you very much for the for the presentation, for your time, and for the for the questions. It's been very good. Thank you very much, and I would like also to thank the attendees, uh, people who asked questions. Um, thank you very much for for your time and, and for your interest in, in the work. It Definitely. A very pleasant experience. So thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye.